This episode brought to you by DoorDash, the app that brings you food you're craving right now, right to your door. Also brought to you by Magic Spoon, as delicious as the cereal from your childhood, only super nutritious. ask me who are some of the current living directors who are changing the way we look at film and what it can do, I'd probably throw out names like Charlie Kaufman, Spike Jones, David Lynch, and Julie Taymor. If you were to also ask me, is imitation the sincerest form of flattery, I would say, I hope so, because we've made fun of her quite a few times on the show. But as easy as it is to satirize someone who goes big and takes chances, it's also rather easy to admire them as well. We all like to give praise when a risk pays off and pot shots when it doesn't. But the fact is, there's directors who take these risks all the time when most would lean towards being safe and marketable. Whether it falls under a success, failure, or somewhere in between, Julie Taymor puts her all into every risk she takes. There's never anything she works on that you could say her heart wasn't in it. This has resulted in some of the craziest, imaginative, visually big, and small productions in theater, opera, and film. If it works, it changes the way you look at the art form. If it doesn't work, it still might change the way you look at the art form. There's always something of value in a Tamor production, and it's always something only she and her bizarre way of seeing the world could create. Like before, I'm gonna focus more on her career than her personal life, and while I will talk about her stage work, I mainly want to talk about her work in film, because honestly, I don't think it gets enough credit. With that said, let's get a little background about where this wonderful weirdo came from. Born in 1952 in Newton, Massachusetts, by age 10 she joined the Boston Children's Theater, no doubt getting the stage bug very early in life. Growing up included a lot of traveling, like to India, Sri Lanka, and Paris each place discovering something new about herself and a new artistic way to express it. This included miming, dancing, mask work, experimental film, and various forms of puppetry. After graduating from college with a major in mythology and folklore, I guess there is money to be made in that, she developed a mask and dance company in Indonesia. She included not only a wide range of talent, but also a wide range of people from different cultures like Japanese, French, German, American, just to name a few. There she'd meet composer Elliot Goldenthal. Yes, that Elliot Goldenthal. Which began both an artistic and romantic relationship. The two have worked on several projects together and are still an item even to this day. Moving back to New York in the 80s, she would bring everything she learned in theater to her stage work. Forming a style you could identify very quickly. It often had a lot of creepy and distorted masks, puppets, or sometimes both. Combining puppetry and masks to create some unbelievably unique performances. In fact, Taymor, not surprisingly, won a Jim Henson Foundation grant, twice, directing a surreal tragic comedy called Liberty's Taken, and another production called Juan Darien, A Carnival Mass. Look at this stuff. This is imagery that leaps off the stage and stays with you for a long time. She would direct not just experimental plays, but also operas and Shakespeare, always giving her surreal personal touch. Some of these did so well that she would not only go back and update them years later, but they would also make their way to cinematic versions. But we'll get to that in a bit. Even before her big screen debut, though, she did do work on a TV movie called Fool's Fire. Based on Edgar Allan Poe's story Hop Frog, this has all the makings of a Tamor production. Weird puppets, distorted scenery, and a story about rooting for the underdog. A dwarf jester, played by Michael J. Anderson, is mocked and abused by a selfish king and his followers. But when the king abuses a dwarf the jester falls in love with, played by Mariel Mose, they both plan a way to get revenge and send them back to their Muppety seamstress. As you can tell, even with this crummy render I have of the film, the visuals are still amazing. It's pretty cool that the dwarves are the only human beings in the production while everyone mocking them is a creepy looking monster. In fact, Anderson and Mose said this was the first production they were portrayed as normal and everyone else around them was a strange creature. I will admit this film might have been a little better as a short. Granted, it's only an hour long, but it feels like a 20 minute story dragged out to 60. There's a lot of scenes that feel kind of fillerish. Still, this was Tamar showing that her visual storytelling could work both on stage and on film, even though her next cinematic outing wouldn't be for another seven years. However, she had a pretty good reason for that. With her name creating more and more buzz, she was approached by a company she honestly thought she would never be able to gel with, Disney. 
Their film Lion King had become a smash hit, and with their first stage outing going phenomenally well, it only made sense to try it with what was the biggest animated film at the time. Tamor had an idea to combine African culture with puppeteers that didn't hide themselves on stage. They would be half actor and half puppet. While this was by no means the first to introduce this idea, it wasn't a mainstream concept. In fact, if you see a stage show today using this method and it has a big budget behind it, you probably have this musical to thank for that. Disney execs looked at the idea, spent a good chunk of time scratching their heads, but ultimately said, yeah, okay. Not knowing if the Broadway crowd would get behind this, wondering if children would be shouting, I can see the puppeteers! Both Disney and Tamor again were taking a big risk. Fortunately, not only did it pay off, it's still paying off. Lion King got rave reviews, was adored by the public, and became Broadway's highest grossing musical ever. It became a staple of stage shows, you don't do a Broadway collage and not include Lion King in there. Has been seen by over 100 million people, and even got Tamor a Tony for Best Director, the first one ever given to a woman. It was one of the biggest gambles to ever pay off in entertainment history. So, what do you do after you create a Disney worldwide phenomenon? Let's do a movie about body parts being hacked off. Titus, based on Shakespeare's most violent play and not the hilarious Fox sitcom, once again utilized a style that had been seen in theater, but not that often in cinema. When a lot of people think of a Shakespeare play, they think of people with puffy sleeves and tights against a stone castle like the prince from Enchanted. But all the ones I've seen have very imaginative settings. Many of them take place in either modern times or no particular time at all. If Hamlet wants to wear jeans, fine. If he wants to wear a golden royal crown, fine. It's more about what matches the character and mood rather than what's historically accurate. Titus, for me anyway, is the first film I saw that incorporated this. The costumes aren't just random, they match each character's persona. The locations don't feel like a place down the street, they help give a more epic feel. And unlike Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet, where I don't think half these actors actually know what they're saying. I do, but keep the peace. Put up thy sword. Or manage it to part these men with me. These actors were given months to prepare. So every word uttered feels authentic and real. Away with slavish weeds and servile thoughts. I will be bright and shine and pearl and gold to wait upon this new-made empress. This would also be the start of what I like to call Fuck You, I'm Julie Taymor moments. Trippy parts that pop out of nowhere, almost screeching the film to a halt like another mini-movie suddenly played in the middle of the one you're watching. Taymor would call these penny arcade nightmares, but... Eh, I think Fuck You, I'm Julie Taymor moments sound better. Now make no mistake, I don't mean this as a bad thing. For the most part, we'll get to those. Because majority of the time, they still serve visually what the characters are going through. Becoming abstract and trying to find a different way to visually get across an idea rather than just telling you. For my money, I love the hell out of this movie. It's violent, disturbing, bloody as hell, yet somehow cultural! Can it be pretentious? Yes. Do I always know what's going on in Tamor's head to justify all this? Not really. But she creates a world and characters that suck you in and keeps surprising you. Look at this opening. Why are they marching like that? I have no damn clue. It's just fucking awesome. I'm sure Tamor has a long, detailed reason why every decision in this was made, but bottom line, it doesn't bother me because it doesn't take me out of the story. If anything, it draws me in more. Yes, it's odd, but it's also epic. And so much of that is because of the acting, the art direction, and those fuck you, I'm Julie Tamor moments that have me questioning more what's going on in a character's head. This film apparently didn't have that big a budget, but you'd never know by looking at it. Its clever choices, resourcefulness, and dedicated passion makes it, in my humble opinion, one of the coolest Shakespeare movies ever. I know it's not for everyone, but it's worth checking out, because if you like it, you'll really like it. Though Titus is my personal favorite of her films, if you were to ask me objectively which one is her best, that'd be her next movie, Frida. The biopic about world-renowned artist Frida Kahlo could not have gotten a more appropriate director. Though I love the artist's work, I feel like I have a much better understanding of it because of this film. So much of Tamor's artistry blends the real world and the surreal world, and this movie brilliantly showed how and why Frida painted what she painted. I like how the story is told pretty straightforward until the accident that would change her life forever. 
Almost instantly, she sees everything in a different way. Again, utilizing those fuck you, I'm Julie Taymor moments in perfect fashion. She almost never verbalizes what she's seeing. It's shown to us through imagery that perfectly tells us what she's feeling and why she needs to paint. Before this film, I never saw this bathtub painting before, but now, every time I see it, I can't help but think back to what she was going through at this point in the movie. It's almost like a visual companion to the woman's life, along with the visual companion to the woman's life. Sama Hayek is good, but I don't know, I get much more bitterness out of the writings and paintings of Kahlo, and the way Hayek plays it comes across as a bit of an act. Shut up, Batson. Who died? Okay, come on up here. No, you come down. They think this house is cursed and that you are the Antichrist. <laughs> Stop. She's not bad, I just see more of a performance than a woman torn apart. It's nothing super distracting, I just never fully bought it. Aside from that though, this is one of the best films you could ever see about an artist. It does so well visually blending this woman's life and artwork while also showing the verbal wit and charm she had as well. Another weird experience, but what else would you expect from an artist like Frida Kahlo? Come in. What are you doing, Nord? I am giving you the report about Earth. Yeah, I know, but why do you sound like a drunk answering machine? I picked up this is how humans think aliens talk. You've been watching unfunny internet comedians again, haven't you? Only the bald ones. So most of them. I've discovered how to solve our food problem. All right, go ahead. You want Chinese, they want pizza, and someone is craving froyo. I'm happy to say there is something for everyone on DoorDash. Oh, really? DoorDash connects you with the restaurants you love right now and right to your door. How about that? And now you can get the grocery essentials you need with DoorDash too. Get drinks, snacks, and other household items delivered in under an hour. All right, being in outer space, that's pretty helpful. Ordering is easy. Open the DoorDash app, choose what you want from where you want, and your items will be left safely outside your door with the contactless delivery drop-off setting. My spaceship has a door. This is perfect. With over 300,000 partners in the U.S., Puerto Rico, Canada, and Australia, you can support your neighborhood go-tos or choose from your favorite national restaurants like Popeye's, Chipotle, and Cheesecake Factory. Mm, I love their chocolate, anything there. And lucky for us, there is a special offer for a limited time, our viewers can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the code NOSTALGIA2021. That's 25% off, up to a $10 value, and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter the code NOSTALGIA2021. Can you say that one more time? I was busy alienating over here. That's code NOSTALGIA2021 for 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change, terms apply. Well, that's amazing. I'm gonna order DoorDash right now. Wait, they don't deliver to space, do they? Let me check. Actually, no. That's cool. I'll just have some Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon? I am unaware. Second sponsorship we have. Honestly, this is one of the better segues. Well, what's so good about them? All right, well, check out this guy here. He's a big cereal nut. He looks it. Yeah, okay, maybe too big a cereal nut. Growing up cereal was one of the best parts of being a kid for him, but he had to give it up because he realized it was full of sugar and junk and stuff that you really shouldn't eat. Yeah, it looks like he does anyway. That's why he's been trying to cut down on carbs, sugar, and unhealthy food. Realizing there's basically nothing else he could eat anymore. Exactly. That is until we found Magic Spoon. With zero grams of sugar, 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs at each serving. It's only 140 calories. Oh, wow. Tone down your enthusiasm because you're about to get even more excited. There's a ton of great flavors. Double wow. In fact, you can try their best-selling flavors in a four-flavor variety pack featuring cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. See that guy there? Guy is totally not me. Totally not me. But he says he loves the variety of flavors. Sometimes he's in the mood for something chocolatey. Sometimes he's in the mood for something frosty. And Magic Spoon is always there with a great cereal. I bet he would say it tastes exactly like regular cereal from childhood. Childhood, only super nutritious. I bet he would say that too, only less annoying. I bet he would say it tastes amazing, honestly, too good to be true. Especially seeing how it's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. I wish to hear about a link! You read the script, I'm so proud. Click the link below to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code NOSTALGIA at checkout to get $5 off any order. Or go to magicspoon.com slash nostalgia. Plus, Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's back with a 100% happiness guarantee. 
So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Well, I should click the link below and use the code NOSTALGIA for $5 off, or go to magicspoon.com slash nostalgia to save $5 today. We should both do that. We're aliens. Her next film would be Across the Universe, which... Do we like this now? People's opinions have been all over the map through the years. Oh, okay, I guess we like it now. This is an interesting experiment, to say the least. It's a love story set in the 60s that uses Beatles songs to get across the emotions and ideas many young people were feeling at the time. While most of you know I'm not a big fan of jukebox musicals, this one, once again, really thinks outside the box. While many of the songs have the same outlook, other songs, like I Want You, has a totally different meaning connecting to the U.S. Army drafting young men to Vietnam. That's an angle I wouldn't have considered. I want you so bad, it's got me bad. So I'm very half and half on this movie, and I mean that literally. I like half this movie. I think the characters are relatable and charming, and the music mixed with the trippy visuals really helps give an idea of what the attitude was like around this time. Then it starts getting lost to its own trippiness, which I know is part of the idea. The teens discover drugs, get really lost in their passion, pain, and need for love, and we just kind of stay there for the rest of the movie. Nothing really seems to push forward that much, as even the fuck you, I'm Julie Taymor moments start to wear out their welcome as the story pretty much vanishes and we're just watching these kids bitch and moan. But I will acknowledge, that's a huge part of the 60s. People did get lost both mentally and physically. I guess I just kind of got bored with it after a while. And for me to get bored with visuals as crazy as this is really saying something. But I'll admit, that's more just my personal take. I can see both halves resonating with a lot of people. I just only connect it with the first half. With that said, the visuals are still cool, the acting is decent, and it's the Beatles, what more do you have to say? I can't promise you'll like it, but it's probably worth checking out just to see if it'll make as strong a connection with you as it did for many others. We next jump to 2010, where one of the biggest, if not the biggest blow that could ever happen to this director occurred. The Tempest. I mean, come on, this is a low-budget stage show on the screen. We expected a lot more. Oh, and this little musical, but I think people want to hear about The Tempest first! Okay, we'll get to this in a second, but I do want to bring up this flick real quick, as, yeah, this just wasn't Tamor's year. I guess it doesn't help that Tempest is not one of my personal favorite Shakespearean plays. You're talking to a guy whose favorite version of the story is probably Forbidden Planet. But man, this film doesn't help that. It follows the story fine, with a few changes and even a gender reversal of one of the leads. But I never thought I would ever say this about a Julie Taymor production. This needed to be weirder. It has good actors, and an occasional fuck you, I'm Julie Taymor moment, but we're mostly just watching people on an island, and... That's it. One of them is Russell Brand, that sure doesn't help anything. Almost nothing about this feels cinematic, or even that visually pleasing. It's almost like Spider-Man was weighing so heavy on her, she forgot to do anything interesting with this idea. Which is strange, because she's directed many stage versions of it that have gotten a lot of praise in the past before. So why am I bringing it up? Because of this scene. Ah, oh, Nora, bitch. Yeah, oh fuck. <laughs> what was that? Was that a blooper they left in, or did they actually write in a Shakespeare play he trips and says, oh fuck. Oh fuck. <laughs> Either reason is amazing, and I just wanted to give it some attention. Okay, let's talk about Spider-Man. There's been so many stories about this epic failure that I'm not even sure how to sum it up. I will say I did read the book, Song of Spider-Man, by the show's writer, which made me understand the troubles a little more. Most people think Tamor being fired from the production was due to wanting to go too big, causing major injuries from insane stunts. No one said this was going to be easy. It's, it's like I say to my actors, LOOK OUT! GET OUT OF THERE! This is a narrative we took a few shots at as well. Having Bono do Spider-Man Turn of the Dark killed! Literally. It literally killed! Hey, you can't make an omelet without breaking some heads, yo. It's true. After reading the book, though, I can say it doesn't seem like those were the main reasons. 
but they didn't help. To paraphrase, with Lion King breaking almost every record known to man, there was a push to do something even bigger. A Lion King with stunts, if you will. We're trying to do everything in live theater that you can't do in two dimensions, in film and television. Bono and The Edge were interested in doing a Spider-Man musical, so it was decided with Tamor helming it, this would be the ultimate Broadway spectacle, with more money and effects than anything ever seen on stage before. Everyone agreed to push the envelope, but it was also agreed it wouldn't be released until Tamor was satisfied with her vision. This led to a record-breaking 182 previews with Tamor still not feeling like she got it right. Bono, the writer, and the producers all agreed, but they were getting impatient with so many delays. And it wasn't just them. Critics got so tired of waiting, they started reviewing the previews, which, big shock, weren't that favorable. Partly because it wasn't technically done. The biggest problem the creators agreed was the first half seemed to win the crowd over, with cheers and roars at the amazing stunts and swinging into the audience. But the second half left people very underwhelmed. They concluded that the action of the first half should be in the second half and the stakes should be made a lot higher, with Spider-Man's foes being real instead of illusions, as was originally written. Everybody agreed to this. Everybody except Tamor. She thought it went against the idea and themes of the show. And that apparently was it for them. There were delays, injuries, a buttload of money being spent, and what seemed like a good solution not being taken advantage of. Tamor was kicked off the production, and it was reworked officially to open in 2011. You can see bits of it on YouTube, and I guess like many people, I'm kind of mixed on the final product. The stunts are pretty cool, and once again, visually, it's amazing to look at. But to say it takes some bizarre liberties is an understatement. And, yeah, sometimes it's just... Lame. Norman Osborn, new and improved, just 10 minutes a day with one of them shake weight thingies. <laughs> Regardless, Tamor's firing made big news. She went from being Francis Ford Coppola after Godfather to Francis Ford Coppola after Apocalypse Now, except without the finished version of Apocalypse Now even being released. What was supposed to be her biggest production became one of her toughest low points. And it would be decades before she'd ever work again. Actually, she got directing again pretty fast. She did another revision of Midsummer Night's Dream, which there is a recorded version of, and it's definitely a return to form. Though the visuals do almost overshadow the performers, it still has a crazy and distinct flair that, once again, is all tamed. After directing a few more productions, she would go on to direct yet another film in 2020, The Glorious. Her second biopic, this time about Gloria Steinem. And I'll just say it, I didn't know who this was. I heard the name before, but I wasn't exactly clear about what she'd done in the past. So it was kind of neat seeing a biography on a person I literally knew nothing about. The story about a journalist turned activist during the women's movement in the 70s is described on Rotten Tomatoes as being uneven yet engaging. I think that's fair. I guess it helps I didn't know her story, so most of what happened legit surprised me, and I did find myself getting pretty interested in it. Yes, it can be preachy and sound bitey, but it's about a writer slash protester. It's kind of impossible not to be. It still has enough about the actual person's life and her accomplishments, both big and small as well as her failures, both big and small. I think Tamor learned the same lesson Clooney did in Good Night and Good Luck, that you shouldn't have actors play the opposing side because it might come across as too one-sided or cartoony. So just show the actual footage of the things the opposition said back then. Honestly, that makes its point more than any actor ever could. There are less of those fuck you, I'm Julie Tamor moments than you would expect, and they are still pretty hit and miss. There's one scene where the movement's losing momentum and she's running on a road towards her goal that's a treadmill to nowhere. And that's pretty effective. The framing device for the film is all the versions of Gloria at different ages on a bus, thinking about the journey, where they're going, and when they'll eventually get there. Again, pretty damn clever. But then there's scenes like this where a reporter asks an inappropriate question. What the fuck is this? Even as a Julie Taymor fan, what the fuck is this? And yeah, 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 I know she has a deep meaning for it, but it just knocks me too much out of the moment to care. Despite scenes like that and a few characters who probably should have gotten a bit more attention, she has a husband for like a minute, I mostly enjoyed this. 
I even like that Julie gave herself a cameo at the end. I can't explain why, there's just something comfortably confident about it. And as of now, there's nothing official yet as to what Julie Taymor is gonna do next, whether it's a movie, stage show, or something else. But whatever it is, you can rest assured, it's gonna be weird as shit. Julie Taymor is clearly a divisive director. Hell, some of her stuff I don't even know if I like half the time. But she always asks you to work a little harder than your average run-of-the-mill entertainment. And I do respect that. Can she get lost in her art to the point where I can't even recognize what it is sometimes? Honestly, I'd expect nothing less from a director like this. Sometimes getting lost can be a good thing, sometimes it can be a bad thing. But I like that someone took a risk asking me to tag along for the ride. Through a distinct style, a mix of cultures, and a passion to explore whatever the hell she wants to explore, we're given ideas and imagery that can be talked about in a variety of ways. Is Julie Taymor genius gone crazy or crazy gone genius? I don't really care. Her work shows me things I've never seen and gets me thinking about stuff I've never thought about. Whether you get into her work or not, there will always be something strange, puzzling, and fascinatingly intriguing to explore every time. I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember? So you don't have to. Yeah, oh fuck. <laughs> hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out. This week we are doing Globus Relief, not to be confused with Global uh, Relief. I made that. <laughs> confusion a few times looking at this, uh, but uh, Globus Relief uh, has a mission to redirect usable health resources locally and globally. Uh, this is a major force for good, creating a reliable uh, humanitarian supply chain that has provided over $200 million worth of medical goods, uh, instrumentation, medical equipment, and other health-related products. Uh, they've sought to cooperate rather than compete with other charities. Uh, cooperate and... Uh, uh, Sorry, seeing those back-to-back -back throws me off. Corporate and business partnerships allow them to redirect humanitarian resources to charity partners. As a result, their mission has impacted over 100 countries, partnering with over 500 charities, and serving over 12,000 projects world worldwide. And this, once again, has a four-star rating on Char Charity Navigator. Uh, if you go to the site, you can see how you can donate, uh, how you can volunteer, or again, spread the word. I know I say that at the end of all of them, but as I also say at the end of all of these, just the more good you can spread around and more attention you can draw to people doing good, uh, I think the better things will be, man. So please look into it or just share the word or donate if you can, because uh, they're doing really, really amazing work. Thank you so much and take care.